to title your notes today, The Big Ask, Part 2. There was so much um, that we covered last week, but we want to kind of stay in that flow. Maybe one more week, we'll just see. Um, five more things came up in my heart, and now that I'm looking back, I'm like, was there f- three or four last, or four or five last week? But anyway, we're going to give you five things today, so I'm, ju- I'm going to jump right into it. Oh yeah, there were five last week. And these things tie together very well with um, what Pastor Dean has been preaching in nightlife the last two weeks. And I even was challenged as I was hearing these truths um, by the Spirit as I'm ministering to me, ministering them to you, to have my own vision in front of me as well as our ministry one. And so I'll have that out in front of me and I encourage you to re-listen to these things and even have those things in front of you as you are hearing. Amen. So big ask part two, let's um, write down John fifteen seven, and we're going to look at this again in a minute. But just to lay a foundation, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask, everyone say ask, what you desire and it will be done for you. Write down this first statement. When you ask, you're putting a demand on the word. You're putting a demand on the word. And remember we said last week, there are some things that you do ask, but then there's others that that definition of the word ask is actually put a demand. We don't ask for healing. We demand it to come. We don't ask for prosperity. We demand it to come because it already belongs to us. But we have to use our words. Just like you use your words to receive eternal life initially, just like you use your words to receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit, you have to use your words to access everything that these relationships provide for us. Matthew 7, 7 through 11, ask, everyone say ask, and you will be given what you ask for. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. For everyone who asks receives, and anyone who seeks finds. If you will only knock, the door will be open. If a child asks his father for a loaf of bread, is he going to be given a stone? If he asks for a fish, will he be given a poisonous snake? Of course not. If you hard-hearted, sinful men know how to give good gifts to your children, won't your Father in heaven even more, say even even more, give good gifts to those who what? Ask. Number one, big ask part two. Number one, no righteousness. No righteousness. You got to know who you are. You got to know whose you are. And it's easy. It's easy to ask. Second Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And Second Corinthians 5.21, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become what? The righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So I have a right to ask. Some of you might need to write that down. I have a right to ask because I am righteous. Like I go here. (laughs) I belong to him. He belongs to me. You've got to know and be confident in your righteousness. Because 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that through his poverty you might become rich. So this happened in redemption. In redemption, in the same way that he took sin and he took sickness, he took poverty. So in righteousness, you became the blessed. You became the wealthy. In redemption, in righteousness, in that package, there is a place of prosperity reserved for you. And so you have to know that place. In Psalms 105, verse 37, it speaks of the, the um, exile of, of the people of Eat. well, the people of Israel moving out of Egyptian bondage. And it says he brought them out with what? Silver and gold. And there was not one feeble, no weakness, no sickness. Now write this down. It's not on the screen. You don't get less in the new covenant. You don't get less in the new covenant. You know, I went through a season of time in my life where I was like, I really liked old stuff. Um, You know, Pastor Greg hated it. I mean, he was such like that extra husband, like, you know, all the antique stores and just the different, you know, and I I went to one um, that I used to, I was like one of my spots back in the day um, when we were in Rio Dosa with the single strip. And I was like, what was wrong with me back then? (laughs) Like it smells in here. I don't want any of this old crap. Like what, like what was going on? You know what I'm saying? It's like, we're paying 
Like, I don't want new crap when you can't get, or old crap, when you can't get new crap. You know what I mean? And not that it's crap, but, but here's the thing. You don't get less in the new covenant than God did in the old covenant. And if he brought them out of Egyptian bondage, they hadn't earned that. They hadn't earned that. And now we have to, we, now we're going to earn Jesus. Now we're going to earn everything that he provided. He brought them out with silver and gold, and there was not one single feeble among them. And then in verse 42, it said, for he remembered his holy promise and Abraham, his servant, and he brought out his people with joy. Everyone say with joy, his chosen ones with gladness. He gave them the lands. He gave them lands and they inherited the labor of the nations. Say this after me, they're working for me. They inherited the labor of the nations, which that's the Gentile. In the Old Testament, um, it's often referred to as the nations. And then in the New Testament, we see the word Gentile. They inherited the labor of the the nations. Say it again, they're working for me. me. And that they might observe his statutes and keep his laws. So again, you don't get less in the new. Hebrews 8, 6 says, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry in as much as he is a mediator of a better covenant. Everyone say better covenant. better covenant, better covenant, better promises. So as good as it was in the old Testament, it's even better now say better now. So no old stuff, no old stuff. The old covenant is just a type and a shadow of what we now have. Nothing wrong with having some knowledge of those things, but you want to spend your revelation hours in the letters where it becomes alive on the inside of you, what God did in Christ in redemption, because your prosperity is there. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law because he was a curse for us. So that the blessing of Abraham, verse 14 says, might come on the Gentile through what? Through faith. So you have to believe in who you are. You have to believe in what has been done for you. You have to eradicate any self-condemnation. You have to eradicate any inferiority. It's not someone else's job to make you feel good about yourself. It's not somebody else's job to help you believe the word of God. It's your job. Now, if you've got pastors who love you and are preaching the truth, they're, they're helping you in that effort. But you still have to get alone with yourself long enough to say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm not trying to prove anything. I'm not trying to earn anything. But by faith, I access my wealthy place. And I believe if he did it for them, he's no respecter of persons, which we're going to see that. Genesis 12, 1 through 3, get out of your country. He told Abraham and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. This is my promise. I will be great. My name will be great. I will be a blessing. What happened? Abraham went out of Egypt. He was very rich. Everyone say very rich. Very rich. In livestock, silver, and in gold. So this is God's plan for you in righteousness. Everyone say in righteousness. Number two, again, big ask. Five more things we got to know. Number two, you reap what you sow. Now this is a big deal because you can have as much as you will cooperate with. And we cooperate with the flow of prosperity in our giving. So if you don't give... And how you give will determine how you access that flow. Galatians 6, 7 says, don't be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, that's what he'll reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the spirit will reap everlasting life. So don't grow weary while doing good for in due season, you will reap if you don't lose heart. So as we have opportunity, let us do good, especially to those who are of the household of faith. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, if you sow sparingly, you're going to reap how? Sparingly. But if you sow bountifully, you're going to reap how? Bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. You're going to increase on the level of your giving. So if you want to continue to cooperate with that flow, and again, you're not earning it, you're just sowing seed. That's, that's how this whole thing works is on the law. It all hinges on the law of seed time and harvest. Yes. 
If you sow a little seed, you're going to get a little harvest. But if you sow a bigger seed, you're going to get a bigger harvest. But don't get weary if you don't see the harvest right away. Stay on your faith. Life takes time. Stay on your faith. Don't compromise the seed with doubt and unbelief coming out of your mouth. Don't compromise the seed with strife and unforgiveness in your heart. Stay in the flow of love. Stay connected to the Holy Ghost. Don't get weary. But if you want to continue to stay in that flow, it's tied to your giving. 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 Proverbs eleven twenty four. There is one who scatters yet increases even more. And there's one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. The generous soul will be made rich. So tied ain't right. We hear Pastor Dean talk about that all the time. Tied ain't right. And guys, tithing isn't giving. Tithing isn't giving. The tithe already belongs to the Lord. There is a protection in the tithe, but your increase isn't in the tithe because the tithe already belongs to the Lord. Your increase is in your offering. That's where you get into the flow of this supernatural place that God has for you. Number three. The Bible reveals precedent. When we're talking about the big ask and we're talking about cooperating with what God has called us to do in this hour and knowing that Jesus came to give us an abundant life. Everyone say an abundant life. Some Christians are going to experience it. Some Christians aren't. That's not up to the Lord. Believers all the time listen to ministers that excuse them of personal responsibility. We saw something yesterday that a very, very famous pastor made mention of. And, and the, the unfortunate thing is, is because I don't follow their ministry. I don't even, I can't really even judge the context, but the implication would be that God's got you taken care of, you know, and that it's all going to work out and that your future is settled and it's going to be good. And, and we do know, according to Jeremiah 29, 11, that God has a good plan for you. But you've got to cooperate with that plan. It's not automatic. It's not just going to happen. You have a part to play in that. And your part is going to determine, just like we said yesterday or last, last week, your um, level of faith is what is actually going to access his ability. Which is why it's so important that you continue renewing your mind and that you hear the word of God and hear the word of God and you don't let things distract you. You know, there's things in this life that have to be dealt with. But Paul said in 1 Corinthians 7, even when he was answering questions and read it in the Mirror Bible, it's so good. And you can get the app. The Mirror Bible app is like 20 bucks, I think, in the app store. I'm not sure if we have copies in the filling station. We don't have copies in the filling station. Um, but, but it's so good in the, in the Mirror Bible because he talks about when he's instructing singles, like, not to, not, like his advice would be to stay single. He's not against marriage. Obviously, we're not against marriage. God created marriage. But his heart is that you would live as distraction-free as possible. And I think about that even in my own life, not in my marriage. Obviously, we have a, a covenant marriage and it's a ministry focus, but so many people don't have that. But even just like little things, I like to stream my, streamline my life where I have to be involved in as little other things as possible than my purpose, my relationship with God, and the relationships I'm supposed to steward. So anything that I can do, if I can get it online, anything that I can streamline in my diet, in everything, I don't want to spend, I don't want to spend my life in the store. I don't want to spend my life in the kitchen. Now, if you're called to the kitchen, you need to, you need to be in the kitchen. But do you understand what I'm saying? Like, I want to spend my life in my calling and in my purpose. Because that's, I don't want to, I don't spend my time in my yard. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to spend my, I'm going to make my life as easy as possible for me to stay focused on him. So anyway, the Bible reveals precedent. Number three, Acts 10, 34, we know God's no respecter of persons. So anytime we see something supernaturally happening in the word of God, we have to realize I can have that. I can have that. So Matthew 17, 24 through 27, I won't read the story because you guys are familiar with it. When the coin was found in the fish's mouth to pay the taxes. 
Now, Jesus had the money for the taxes. We know he did. We know he had the money for the taxes. He had a treasurer. He had more than enough money to pay the bills, right? But what is he doing? He's creating a precedent for us. That yes, you can have money in the bank, but he's able to do supernatural things for you. But you've got to set your faith for that. There's many things maybe that you've released your faith for that you could pay for, but you can also simultaneously believe for supernatural things. And I encourage you, and I know it was a book of the month last year, Faith, Foolishness, and Presumption, wasn't it? Was it a book of the month last year? But, but continue to feed on that reality. Like when, when Fred Price was still learning the things of faith, he believed God because he didn't have money to turn on the air conditioning or whatever. But once you get past that, you, you don't believe God for that. You go out and get it. Right. You have the means to get it. Right. You have the means to get it. You go out and you get it. Right. You know, I remember hearing um, one of our instructors at Rama. He was a new pastor at a church. And um, they had kind of made promises that they didn't keep as it pertains to his salary. And so it came Christmas time and it was literally like they had no money for the kids, like no money for the gifts whatsoever. And so he has a choice to make. He either looks at these little babies in the eyes and for the sake of the ministry, they now suffer. <laughs> or he, he had a credit card and he just bought some gifts. And that happy Christmas, that money is available to you. It's not a sin to borrow. Okay. It's a sin to get yourself under pressure. Okay. But like, if it's a sin to borrow, then we would be aiding and abetting if we were to be the lender and not the borrower. And so people have gotten off and they've gotten their focus on the wrong thing. Like in essence, he's either going to have these kids have a bad and, and, and it's just a mentality it's like you want somebody else to pay for it because you don't want to charge it. Well, you, you need to charge it. You have access to that. Yeah, yeah. And just add that interest into the overall cost of the thing and get happy. Yeah. Yeah. Get happy and trust God to continue to increase you. But don't walk around with like a poverty mentality. But stay in the middle of the road though. What I'm saying is stay in the middle of the road. I'm not saying to max out your credit cards. I'm saying stay in the middle of the road. Be balanced about these things. If it's a desire of your heart to owe no man anything financially, there's a place for that. But if you're not there right now, you can use the, to the tools that are available to you. Otherwise, then nobody's buying a house. Nobody's buying a car. You just get weird. You're walking around. You're riding a bike. You're getting rides. You have access to things. So what was that? There's precedent. Second Kings four, one through seven, a certain woman of the wives of the sons of prophets cried out to Elisha saying, your servant, my husband is dead. And he feared the Lord. The creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. Notice Elisha didn't say, well, you never should have borrowed. He didn't say that. He didn't say that. So Elisha said, okay, well, what, what, how do you want to work this out? What do you have in the house? And that's the thing. Like, what do you have? What do you have? You know, when I was in college, I still worked full-time. <laughs> I still worked full-time. And then I worked on the weekends on top of that. Nannying. I did a lot of nannying, which is it's sad for those kids. <laughs> you know? And honestly, one of them's already in glory. So, I mean, what do you have to say about that? Um, it wasn't at my doing, but I'm just saying. <laughs> like, that was definitely not my golly. <laughs> So what, what do you want me to do? Like, what do you have? All I have is a jar of oil. Perfect. That's all we need. Go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors. Get as many of them as you can. Don't just get a few. And when you've come in, shut the door behind your sons, pour it into all the vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went from him, shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels, poured it. And it came to pass when the vessels were full, she said, bring me another vessel. And he said, there's not anymore. And so when they were out of vessels, the oil stopped running. Then she came. So there's precedent here that God can take a little thing that I have and he can multiply it and then I can continue to feed on that. So there's precedent in the word. Number four. Now this is a big one. And this really ticks off religious people, which is like what we do around here. So we hate religion. 
Honor for the Lord, or honor for the word, you could say Lord too. Honor for the word or for the Lord takes priority over the poor. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So good. Honor for the word takes priority over the poor. If you want to increase, you have to have this straight between your ears. Okay? You have to have this straight between your ears, in your giving, in your sowing, or you're going to keep sowing and you're not going to access the flow. Because the po- poverty doesn't a- access the flow. Sowing to poverty doesn't access the flow. Look at Mark 14, verse 1. After two days, it was the Passover and the feast of the unleavened bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. But they said, not during the fe- feast, lest there be any uproar of the people. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. She broke the flask and poured it on his head. Now, Jesus is the word, right? Yeah. We know that. John 1, 1, John 1, 14. So in essence, she is, she's providing an offering for the word. Okay. So she poured it over his head and there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? It could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and what? Given to the poor. They criticized her sharply. Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always. And whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me, you do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will be told as a memorial to her. Now, I want to give you some some information just in America alone. The five states with the highest poverty rates, and what's so interesting about these states is many of these states are led by a certain political party. They have representation by a certain political party whose whole platform is to help poor people. Notice that. The states that have the most poverty are, are run by the Democratic Party whose whole platform is to eradicate poverty. It's all a lie. It's all a lie. Why? Because you can't, uh, giving money to poor people does not eradicate poverty. Now that doesn't mean that we don't sow seed. That doesn't mean we don't give turkeys. That doesn't mean that we don't bless people. But we recognize that blessing people is not going to be their breakthrough. It's not. That's not what Jesus said. What did Jesus say in Luke chapter four, verse 18? The spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. What gets people out of poverty? It's not a handout. It's the gospel. People who have come into this church broke, busted, disgusted, on drugs, with nothing, losing their jobs, no job, a, 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 a lower paying job. How did they come up? We hear testimonies all the time. It's not because we reached out to them in sympathy, which is a load of garbage, because they're a single mom or whatever. No, they took the word and they worked the word. We got a testimony. You'll hear about it next week because we already had one scheduled this week. We got a single mom in this church delivered from drugs in a a great place, just got had to move employment because it wasn't good, got a different job with an additional $7,000 a year. Not because we took it on, but because we preached the gospel and she took the gospel. So New Mexico is number three. Mississippi, 19.6%, Louisiana, 19%, New Mexico, 18.2%. So we're in the top three by a very small margin as well, right? So what do you have to do? Well, that's on us. Like, clearly we have to preach the gospel. Clearly we have to preach the gospel on television stations in the state of New Mexico. Clearly somebody's not getting the job done and we're here. Now, I want to claim Texas. Don't get me wrong. But we are actually in New Mexico. So this is on us. This is preaching the gospel to the poor. Now, this is what's so interesting. Poverty rankings in the United States, 30%, which is the highest percentage of of basically the reason for poverty in the United States is adults not working. That's the highest. What am I saying? I'm saying... When you come to church, every time, every time, you don't need to hear about something special that's going on. 
You don't need a fund. I remember being in my office years ago and looking at these things and, and I asked my mom, like, what is this poor fund? We don't have a fund for poor. We're not gonna have people come in here and designate money to poor like we're not helping poor people all the time. That's religion. I don't want that. Get that off of there. We're not doing that. Every time you give here, if this is where you go and wherever you go, wherever you're going online, if you don't believe in the word that is being preached there, if you don't believe in how that word is being distributed and you have more offering going elsewhere, you're not connected right. There's some, there's some wires that are not, they're not connected. For the man of God, for the word of God. You know, I had somebody reach out to me several weeks ago like, Pastor Charity, you're the director of the co-op. Yes? Yes. I am. I am the director of the co-op. And, okay, listen, we want to sow a seed. We want to sow a $10,000 seed to the playground over there. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's the word. That's the word. So kids, which, you know, those things are on the list. We have plans, but you have to have people who work. You know what I mean? And you have to, like, put that on the list. Our staff are very busy. So that's on the list, but, but they have that in their heart. Like this is, that $10,000 could have probably done something for the poor, right? Could have done something for the poor, but that's the wrong attitude. That's the wrong attitude. And again, it's not one or the other. It's a priority. So you have to have it straight in your head that every time you give offerings into your church, that's the flow every week. You don't have to know there's something special going on. (laughs) There's always something special going on. There's money flying out of here every single month. There's money flying out of here every single week. And if you don't trust where it's going and that it's going in the right place, go find somewhere where you can follow people who you can trust. Because if it's not here, don't be here. Because it's not gonna hurt us, it's gonna hurt you. And you're gonna sit here year after year after year in your broke, busted, financial, disgusted place and blame it on the message of faith. Get out of here, get out of here. You gotta be a doer. You gotta be a doer. Honor for the word takes precedent over the poor. Which means, do I believe that the word is being preached? Is it going forth without any compromise? Is it powerful? Is it uncompromised? I'm backing that financially. I'm backing it financially. And God knows my heart. I honor that. I honor that. I honor that. There's never a time that you go through the drive-thru and you don't have to pay. Unless you have points from Pizza Hut. And they accumulate. What does that mean? That means there's a place of honor for you to step into that creates a flow of giving every time you come to service. Every time you come to service, you are sowing, you are sowing, you are sowing, you are sowing, you are sowing. Why? Because it honors the word. It honors the word. An entire year's salary poured out goes to practically nothing, right? Change the way you think. People think, well, that's just a waste. No, your small, pathetic life is a waste. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Miss Darla just made a face. <laughs> so what do poor people need? They need the gospel. Yeah. They don't need my money. I've never given somebody money on the street, and we give money to people on the corners all the time. Right. We always do that. I'm not saying it's one or the other. I'm just saying there's a priority, yeah. right? We were out of town in Portland last year, And we gave a lady some money and she came back around, made a rounds. We gave it to her again. Listen, it's fine. If you forgot us, we didn't forget you. Okay. It's fine. Have some more, have some more, you know, it's not one or the other, but it's a priority. People who are poor need the gospel preached to them, not their, not their month's rent. Cause then they need the rent again and again and again. You know, scholarship for the, you know, for school or for, um, and you need it every year for the rest of your life, for camp. It's a mentality. It's a mentality. Let's end on a, number five, be obedient. Be obedient. You have to do what the Lord tells you to do. You cannot do your own thing or do what you think you should. And then you get yourself under pressure. And then you want God to bail you out because you're trying to be somewhere where you're not. And then you put pressure on yourself. 
these things. It's like, just like fire, shut up in my bones. It's not that. It's like pissed off, shut up in my bones. You know what I mean? How people do, do things. John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. What's, what's the beginning of that? If you abide in me and my word abides in you. There's a priority on your relationship with the word. That's where it starts. If you love me, John 14, 15, you'll do what I say. So then, then there's confidence for the big ask because you're obedient. You're obedient. You're a doer. What did God tell um, the people of Israel in Deuteronomy 28? If you diligently obey my voice, obey me. God told Brother Hagin that, listen, I have no problem with my people being rich. I have pe- I have problem with my people being covetous. If you will obey me, I will make you rich. I will make you rich. When Brother Hagin passed away, while we were there, he himself was funding every, every, Rhema, every Rhema student. We paid $3,000 a year for Rhema, but it cost them six. Brother Hagen supplemented the other half of every student's tuition himself. Himself. And I can attest to that. I don't know because I don't look at the records, but I know that our staff are probably some of the biggest givers percentage-wise, of the entire congregation, (laughs) percentage-wise, right? You don't have to look mad at me. I'm not the problem. I'm here to help. I'm here to help. And if you really like this belt, you can buy it at the filling station bookstore. (laughs) It's like one of my favorite things right now, but I don't want to, I didn't want to be weird about it. So I didn't want to start with that because then it would come across shallow. But I'm like, wow, I really, really like this belt. So like, we're all good. We're all friends here or we can be, you know what I mean? Like, but we have to know the truth because the truth sets you free. So his personal ministry finances, the money that came to him personally was paying for half of every student's tuition. You have to be obedient. You have to do only what he tells you to do. Yes. You have to be obedient. Right. You have to be obedient because if you will, what does he want to do? All these blessings will come on you and overtake yes. you. So if that hasn't happened, what's the problem? Yeah. What's the problem? We need confidence when we ask. So being obedient to him, and we may go into these three things in the next couple of weeks, but let me just give you these thoughts. Number one, feed on the word. This is how you honor him. This is how you're obedient to him. Feed on the word. Number two, pray in the spirit. Number three, stay in love. There is nothing that God has planned for you that is too big. And in many cases, you're you're in in a process of renewing your mind to come up to a, a place that's high enough to meet his plan. It's so big. His plan for you is so big. And not just for your ministry, not just, not just for your business, but for you personally. He wants you to have and enjoy life. But he's going to lead you. And if you're not obedient, you know, there was a time when um, brother and sister Copeland needed $50,000. I believe it was $50,000 for television. It was way back in the day. Yeah. They needed $50,000 for television. They didn't have it. And they had a plane, and, um, and the Lord told Brother Copeland to sell that plane. And they, they couldn't sell the plane to get the TV money because they still needed the plane. But God told them, and I'm telling you, like, you have to hear God. Yeah. You have to hear God, because most people, they think that it's going to come some other way. Right. No, it's not. Right. You're going to reap what you sow. Yeah. So he sold the plane, and Miss Gloria's thinking, okay, well, now we need $200,000 because we need 150,000 to replace the plane and we still need the 50,000 for the television. And within two weeks, a woman came in and it was their first big, uh, it was their first $200,000. She gave them a $200,000 check in two weeks time. 
So not only was the plane money totally restored, but then in that was the $50,000. But what, but what unlocked that? He had to, he had to be obedient. They had a partner one time that um, had lost his job and it was a good paying job. And he just determined like, I'm, I'm faithful. I'm faithful to the Lord. He got up every single day, got dressed. You know, you lose your job. You know, you feel sorry for yourself. You feel like a victim, whatever, whatever. He didn't do that. He got up, he went to a coffee shop. He got his Laws of Prosperity book by Kenneth Copeland. And he, he saw that as his job. And he went to work at the coffee shop with his Bible and with that book. And he just began to meditate and renew his mind to the Laws of Prosperity. And he went on, he, was, he went on to be very successful in his own business. He was their first partner who gave him a million dollar seat. And he went from a place of being, you know, because in many cases, people get so twisted by things like that. Things that happen in your employment, frustrations, a dip in the economy, you know, just go berserk. Like the word changed. You know, they, they cut my pay and you just go berserk. You just go crazy. Like this isn't true. Like, you, like your destiny is tied to the decisions of men. But if you'll put your faith in God... And if you'll be obedient to what he says, you will access that wealthy place. Amen.